Hey Vault Dwellers, JV here, and today I'm discussing details from the game guide for Fallout 76. Be sure to subscribe and hit the bell for more Fallout 76 videos just like this. Before we get started, I wanted to give an update on my plans for content. I shared a video last week lining out what I would be delivering on a weekly basis, and of course, it was a bit ridiculous. I have a habit of over-promising and under-delivering, something I'm constantly working on, and I've realized that I can't reasonably stream and record content designed for videos at the same time. Those two things are mutually exclusive, and because of that, my regular tips and tricks content, you know, guides with specific detailed information will be on hold until launch. This will result in better videos overall and less incomplete information. It's no use to you guys if I'm just guessing half the time. So until then, expect more open-ended and news-based commentary five days per week like usual, and tips of the day will also be on hold until then. Let's also talk about the beta tonight. The beta resumes and will finally be on all platforms starting at 7 p.m. Eastern time, according to the Fallout Twitter. Xbox One and now PC and PS4 players will be able to play the game. This is super exciting for me because the more people playing, the more information will be out there and the more I'll be able to share with you guys. And just a note, sometimes Bethesda puts the servers up a little bit early and then shuts them down like five to 10 minutes after the beta end time. So you'll want to start up the game and try to connect 15 to 30 minutes early in order to maximize your playtime. A lot of PC folks have also been wondering if the beta starts earlier for them since the Bethesda launcher seems to unlock like two hours before 7 p.m. Eastern. My guess is that you'll be able to launch the game, you'll be able to launch the client once the timer runs out, but the servers will be down. You'll get an error like you lack the required entitlements or something along those lines, so it won't matter. You can't play the game unless the servers are up. I will be streaming my entire experience right when it starts at 7 p.m. Eastern over on my Facebook page. So link in the description if you want to come hang out and check out the game. All right, let's dive into the guide. The official game guide by Prima has released six preview images before it actually comes out with the game that gives us some insight into lore, perks, factions, and zone information. I've left a link below to the Amazon page where you can see all of these for yourselves. We're going to go over each of these one by one. So first off, this image gives us some great information on what to expect from each region in the game. I'll give you a short version of what they have here. The forest is rich in plant and animal life and relatively untouched by the bombs, though it still has mutated beasts roaming around. The primary locations are the Flatwoods, a small community, Morgantown, a larger settlement and home of Vault Tech University, and Charleston, one of the largest cities in the area and the capital of the state. Toxic Valley is covered in industrial white powder and is home to all manner of mutated aquatic beasts. The Grafton Steel Mill was the center of economic development for the town of Grafton, which was a shipping hub. Grafton Dam, now filled with polluted water, separates the Toxic Valley from the forest. The Ash Heap is a smoky region filled with mines that run deep into the Appalachia's mountains. Mount Blair is at the top of the region, which was a large-scale coal mining site before the war. The Garahans and Hornwrights were the two families controlling the mining industry, and their estates also are in this region. Savage Divide is a mountainous region that is difficult to navigate. It's home to the top of the world, which is a tourist location for skiers. The Palace of the Winding Path is a spiritual center with unique architecture. You can also find the mysterious government facilities in these mountains. The Mire is a dark, swampy section that is heavily mutated thanks to the Dyer chemical plant. Harper's Ferry is a small tourist town that was at odds with the Free State's faction. The survival training center here was open to tourists who wanted to learn how to rough it. Granberry Bog is a colorful region avoided more than any other after the war. It's home to the Allegheny Asylum for the Mentally Ill and Watoga, which is a city of the future built by the government, Robco, and the Atomic Mining Services. It's full of security robots, so probably pretty dangerous. Along the right side, we get more information about the factions of the game. The Brotherhood of Steel and their presence in West Virginia is mostly Taggarty's Thunder, which is a unit led by Elizabeth Taggarty, a former U.S. Army Ranger. She only recruited those with military experience and definitely rubbed elbows with the other factions in the Appalachia. Also, their base is at Fort Defiance. The Free States are a group of anarchists who actually seceded from the U.S. before the bombs dropped. They built their own concrete bunkers out side of the vault tech ones, and Raleigh Clay was the leader of them, also a U.S. Senator Sam Blackwell, so we'll have to learn more about them. The Raiders are fairly self-explanatory, although it does say that several wealthy tourists on ski holidays reverted to their basic instincts, so these entitled elitists are the ones who became the Raiders, which is a different spin on this faction. The responders exist to help other people survive the Great War with automation and survival training to ensure that people have what they need in order to survive. 
Finally, White Spring has a long history of business with the federal government and U.S. presidents. However, it had to sell a lot of its land and replace its staff with robots before the war under financial strain. It's important to note that we know there are other factions in the game. We know the Enclave is most certainly in the game. And so I don't know if this page continues like on the next one and we just don't have that preview page or not. But that's the information we have right now. I expect at least one or two more factions. On to the next image, we get a lot of basic Pip-Boy info. The only in Info I found worth sharing was down here. Enemy subtypes include bosses with the crown icon. Those are the ones that drop more loot than normal. Legendaries with the star, they have a chance of mutating and dropping a legendary piece of gear, you know, an item. Radioactive enemies have that radioactive symbol and will give you more rads. Toxic enemies will poison you. They have a poison symbol. Weak enemies, which is kind of weird. I guess those are just like under leveled for you. Extra difficult enemies with stars or skull enemies that you can't kill. Obviously, we need more information, but the extra difficulty enemies sounds like a way for the game to sort of scale difficulty since there's no difficulty select. There are no difficulty modes in this game. There's just one difficulty. But for example, really tough enemies that are supposed to be a challenge for you no matter what level you are will have some extra stars beside their names. This page also tells us that we're alerted to the type of damage we're currently receiving in the bottom left near our health bar. This is useful in determining what kind of perks and armor you'll need for certain enemy damage types. You know, if there is a radioactive enemy, then you'll want something that has rad resistance. This page is full of great perk information. First and foremost, it confirms the total number of perks in the game on launch. There will be 211 perk cards in Fallout 76. I understand that to mean 211 individual perk cards with their own set of ranks. Now we do know that there are expert and master versions of perk cards. It's generally assumed that we'll be able to equip the regular expert and master versions of these cards at the same time in order to push those effects even further. We're not sure if those are included in the 211 number, but right now I'm assuming that they are. We know that Hacker, Pick Lock, and all the direct damage perk cards like Gunslinger will have those options, but outside of that, we're not really sure. I expect most cards will not have Expert and Master versions, only very specific ones, but again, that's just speculation right now. Some other observations I have, from the footage up to this point, we know that there will be around 71 perk card options by level 17. We'll have unlocked that many to choose on each level up. If the total at the end of the game, when it's all said and done, is 211, that means we'll have 33% of all perk cards available to choose by that point. Level 17 is also 34% of the way to level 50. So stay with me here. If the unlock patterns remain similar, and I believe they will, that makes me think that we'll have all 211 perk cards unlocked and available to choose by level 50. Another way to put this is, I'm guessing there won't be a perk card with a level requirement above 50. All will be unlocked by that point, and you will be able to choose them each time you level up beyond 50. I could very well be wrong about this, but those numbers seem to make sense to me. The only other piece worth noting here is the perk card sharing. Now, I don't know if anyone has tested this, but the wording here makes me think that you can only share one perk card at a time with Charisma. This could be the difference of semantics in the wording chosen in this guide. Maybe that's what's throwing me off, but that would definitely change my perspective on Charisma if we were limited to sharing one perk at a time. Also, obviously, there are a ton of new perks here listed. We don't know their level unlocks, but you can dive in and kind of zoom in and look at these perks individually if you want. Next, we get some interesting info on enemy levels and what we're going to encounter in each region. While we do have this threat level chart, the text says enemies are going to be significantly higher or lower than your own level, just as much as they're going to be the same level as your character, which essentially means you're going to run into all kinds of levels in any area. But, you know, some areas like the forest, you're not going to see a level 60. That would just be ridiculous. So enemy levels and the correlation between damage and health is super confusing to me. So I'll have to do some more testing when the game is actually Actually out. We also learn about what are called fissure sites. They're almost exclusively in the top four level areas, the Savage Divide, the Mire, and Cranberry Bog. Fissure sites will always be guarded by powerful enemies and level 50 to level 65 Scorch Beasts. This guide recommends that you stay away until you reach a main quest that sends you there because it is tough. In this notes before you go section, the guide suggests that rushing through the main quest is a bad idea. The level jump from area to area can be a real smack in the face, so take your time in each region. This page covers more region information going as far as giving us how many locations are in each area. And according to this chart, there are 
852 total locations in Fallout 76, 358 primary and 494 secondary. The Forest and Savage Divide are the most dense, while Toxic Valley is the least. The guide also says there are probably more secondary locations than they've recorded, so there's even more out there to explore. Primary locations are marked and will remain on your map. They also serve as fast travel points, which means when it's all said and done, we'll have 358 locations to travel to, which is just insane. Secondary locations are unmarked and can't be fast traveled to, but have some sort of purpose, some loot, maybe for a quest, something like that. The final preview image focuses on Zone A of the forest. It shows us every primary location along with bobblehead locations, cap stashes, and magazines. It also claims there's no power armor here, but I've yet to confirm that to be a fact. Regardless, this is super helpful information. I was under the impression that bobbleheads and magazines were random spawns, but apparently not. Again, something I'll have to confirm myself. That's it for today's video. I'm really excited to dive into the full guide when it becomes available. It was a great resource for Fallout 4, and from what I've seen, I'm sure it will be for Fallout 76 too. In the comment section, tell me which region you plan to spend the most time exploring. Share your thoughts below. If you enjoyed the video, remember to subscribe and hit the bell for more Fallout 76 content, like my last video where we discuss my gunslinger build. Thanks so much for watching, and I'll talk to you next time.